Okay, I'll start over. Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. Today we have Brian Swingle. He got his PhD in MIT, had a long voyage from Harvard to Stanford to Maryland, and now recently came to Brandeis University where he's on the faculty, and we're very happy to have him locally. Brian is going to tell us about hydrodynamic and corrections to random matrix universality and quantum chaos. That's quite a mouthful. So I hope you'll enlighten us on all those things. We're looking forward very much to it, Brian. It's yours. Great. Thank you very much for the chance to speak here. Nice to see you all. Thank you for the kind introduction. And yeah, today I'm going to talk about well, I'm going to talk about the idea of random matrix universality, which is a universal feature of the energy spectrum of many kinds of quantum systems. And I'm going to talk about how we can understand the origin of that universality and what it has perhaps surprisingly to do with hydrodynamics. And hopefully you'll see all these things together. And uh, yeah, so let me just get started. And of course, I, I welcome questions at any point. So please stop me if you have anything. It's unclear. And so the starting point is really this old observation of Wigner that if you have a very complicated quantum mechanical system, like a heavy nucleus, um, where, where there are lots of energy levels, or in this case, resonances, but nearly, nearly ideal energy levels, just with a you know some width, then if you want to actually calculate the detailed spectrum of the system or measure the detailed spectrum, it's very complicated. It looks like some erratic, hard to predict set of energy levels. However, the spectrum has certain statistical regularities that can be well modeled using a random matrix, a random Hermitian matrix. And I just want to flag that, you know, there's actually a very large variety of random matrices, of course. But for this story, people primarily focus on Gaussian ensembles. Um, and you know, I'm happy to discuss more generally what's going on later in the talk, but I think that that's good enough for us now. And so the basic idea of this sort of random matrix universality is that large classes of complex quantum systems have this sort of unstructured or erratic energy spectrum, and we can model the statistical properties of that spectrum using a random matrix. And here's a famous example of that from uh, nuclear physics. These are, you take a nucleus, you scatter neutrons off of it, you measure the resonances, you order them in order, and then you look at the statistical distribution of spacings between the nearest neighbor resonances. And that's what this histogram in the background is. And then this black curve that vanishes at zero and then goes up and then goes down again. This is the prediction of random matrix theory. In fact, you can get this curve just by solving a two by two matrix problem, or at least a good approximation to it. And in particular, you see it, it's very unlikely to have levels that are nearly degenerate. If these levels did not have what's called level repulsion, you would expect something more like Poissonian distribution, in which case there'd be some high probability to have levels with zero splitting. But for this random matrix, you have level repulsion. You don't want to have levels that are nearly degenerate. And so there's a suppression in weight at this low end of the spectrum. And then the high end of the spectrum is suppressed because you have this Gaussian probability for your matrix elements, and that pushes this part down. Because that's kind of the origin of this curve. It's level repulsion plus the Gaussian envelope. OK. And this is just one example, but we can take all kinds of other examples. For example, heavy atoms have the same kind of spectrum. If you look at a quantum mechanical spin chain, say, here's an example of a so-called quantum easing chain with just eight spins, so 256 energy levels. And this on the right here is an example of the spectrum of this spin chain. I just computed this exactly in my computer. And you can see you have these states at very low energy and very high energy that look special. There's like a big gap. The ground states are always special. But in the middle of the spectrum here, this is where we expect the random matrix universality to hold. 
And if you indeed look at the statistical properties of adjacent levels, they will conform to that same GOE prescription that I gave on the previous slide. This has also been related to ideas of quantum chaos, thanks to the famous bohegas janani schmidt conjecture, which basically says if you take a classically chaotic system and look at its levels semi-classically, quantumly, that those levels will also look like the levels of a random matrix, okay? So we have this very general property, random matrix like level spacings. And the goal of this talk is to, first of all, make this property as obvious as possible in the sense that it's a very generic property we see all over the place in nature. So there should be some very generic framework or understanding of where this property comes from. So that's part one. Part two is to say, okay, this property is there, but of course, real systems are not random matrices. Uh, you know, they have structure, they have locality, they have few body interactions and so forth. And so there should also be some sort of corrections to this picture arising from the structure of real physical systems. And we'd also like to calculate those corrections and understand their form, okay? Now, what I've talked about so far is just the statistics of the nearest neighbors, but actually energy levels further away than nearest neighbor are also correlated. And a very nice way to capture this effect and the sort of central player in our talk today will be what's called the spectral form factor. And this object, which I'm going to just denote SFF, spectral form factor, it's a function of time, big T. Big T is always time, never temperature in this talk. And the way you get it is by tracing the time evolution operator. So you just evolved you for time t, it's the exponential of the Hamiltonian. You trace that, you square that quantity, the absolute value squared, and you average it over some ensemble of Hamiltonians. The reason why you need to do the averaging is because if you look at a single instance of this, this form factor is typically an erratic function of time. So it oscillates wildly and the oscillations and the erratic behavior are as big as the sort of average value. So you really need to do some sort of disorder averaging, as it's called, in order to reveal the underlying regularity. And it's that disorder average quantity that we can hope to predict. So we're not going to predict the precise detailed erratic behavior for any given system. We're going to predict this sort of averaged, you know, uh, regular part of the form vector. Now, it'll be important later that you can think about this um, as a pair of time contours, a forward going contour in red and a backward going contour in blue, which are periodically identified. And so you can think of this trace as sort of like the sum over all return amplitudes. So you start in some state, you calculate the amplitude to return to that state of time t, and you add that up over all possible initial states. And what we'll see in a moment is that for random matrices, and more generally for this large class of chaotic or random matrix-like systems, what one observes is that the form factor is linear in time for a very long time. And this will actually encode really the, the general long-range correlation between levels in your system. And so the central question can then be phrased as, you know, under what conditions is, is this behavior realized? And that's what we're going to address in this talk. And I want to highlight this is a, a, a work that we've been working on for, for many years now with my student, Mike Weiner. And uh, it started in this paper from a couple of years ago. And I'll talk about this paper first, but we've now written quite a few different works on this topic. And uh, I'll, at the end, discuss uh, some forthcoming work that hasn't even been finished yet. Um, but I'll tell you about the preliminary results there. So let's just explain, so we're all on the same page, what to expect for um, this form factor. So here's a typical so-called single trace matrix ensemble. So we have a probability measure, we have matrix elements, and we have some distribution, which in this case is given by taking some polynomial function of the matrix, taking a trace, okay? And because you have this trace, it means this only depends on the eigenvalues of the matrix, not on the eigenvectors. And so therefore, it makes sense to go to a basis of eigenvalues. 
And then depending on the symmetry of this matrix, that's where these different ensembles come in. You have either Tumorversal symmetry, that's GOE, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, or no Tumorversal symmetry, GUE, Gaussian unitary ensemble. There's an, other ensembles like the symplectic ensemble. Let's not worry about those. But the, the main point is that you can convert this to a distribution of eigenvalues. There'll be an index here called the Dyson index. And it essentially tells you how strongly you have this level repulsion effect between your neighboring levels. So you see that effect here, the probability is suppressed when levels coincide. However, there's also a long ranged effect. And if you think of this as a sort of statistical model, you can think of the eigenvalues as being your positions of particles in some one dimensional line. This V of E is like an external potential that confines those particles in some region. And this measure here, if you exponentiate it, can be interpreted as a long range logarithmic energy between eigenvalues. So it's like an interacting gas of particles in 1D with some external potential set by V and some universal interaction controlled just by the symmetry. Can I ask a question, Brian? Please. Uh, do any of your results apply in uh, things that are in dimension greater than one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this, this, yeah, the, the results that I'll talk about are not specific to 1D. This 1D is just a picture of this, this so-called Dyson gas or log gas or Coulomb gas of eigenvalues. Okay, so yeah, you, you can essentially think of this gas as like a, this is like a, because it has this long range force, it's a very rigid gas or very rigid liquid. The form factor is like essentially giving you the structure factor of that liquid. So if you scattered some particles off of this liquid, this would be a very rigid liquid and that would translate into this ramp feature here. So the basic structure is at very early time, the form factor decays rapidly. That's called the slope. These wiggles here coming from the Fourier transform of the density of states, which is a Bessel function, but they eventually die out. And then you reach this ramp regime here. This typically goes from some relatively short time out to a time set by the Hilbert space size. That's called the Heisenberg time. So this ramp is a very long period where you have this almost perfectly linear behavior. And then at very late time, you have a plateau, which is where you've reached a time that's longer than the inverse level spacing. Okay, so once you've reached this point, there's no more repulsion, and you're just seeing the individual eigenvalues. Okay, so there's a, there's a prediction from random matrix theory of what this form factor should be. It's an integral over all energies. We can include a factor f called a filter function that lets us zero in on a particular part of the spectrum. So we'll often use this to be a Gaussian just to single out some particular band of energies. And then there's the time, pi, and the Dyson index. So in particular, for the unitary ensemble, which we'll mostly focus on, this Dyson index is 2. And so the prediction is 2 t over 2 pi. OK, and so you can remember that. It'll come up again later. Now, just one more thing I want to tell you before we kind of get into the, the details. Um, which is this notion of Thales time. Because the form factor is like the, the two-point function of energies, it's uh, also useful to consider the so-called connected form factor. That's where we take the form factor and subtract off the average squared. That's what's here. So this is just controlled by the density of states. So the blue is the full form factor. The red or the orange here is the connected part. And you can see you just get this nice smooth ramp and then the plateau. Okay, so our goal is to calculate this connected form factor and to see under what conditions for some class of systems you recover this ramp behavior. And we'll define the Thales time as the time on the x-axis here that we need to reach before we're close, let's say epsilon close to this linear ramp behavior. Okay, so one of the goals of the theory will be to calculate the Thales time for a particular system and relate it to other interesting quantities. Okay, I'll just highlight that, you know, there's been some work in this area, 
um, mostly in the context of solvable models. What we'll present is sort of a, a framework or a theory based on effective field theory, which we would suggest applies quite generally and uh, can recover a lot of these prior, prior results, but on a sort of more general framework. Okay, so the plan, I just did the backgrounds. Uh, I'm gonna first talk about an example of how structure in a system, in this case, spatial locality, sort of interferes with the random matrix universality. And then I'll describe how we can understand how the universality is recovered at long enough time. And then I'll talk about this effective theory that we developed. And finally, I'll discuss some elaborations that we've been working on recently, including what happens when you have sound modes, what happens in the case of glasses, which you know you might think of as being somehow special. They don't fully thermalize. This is something are they somehow different? And also some interesting new physics at, at late time. Okay, so that's the plan. And again, please ask questions at any point if you have them. Let me just skip this. Just to say, like, there's a big body of work here going back to sort of what, what could be called the old quantum chaos literature um, from a much earlier period. And then it's kind of been reinvigorated recently by an interest in what people call many body chaos. So kind of chaos in quantum field theory or chaos in quantum many body systems. And as we'll see, a central tool will be played by what has been, what has come to be known as fluctuating hydrodynamics. And this is essentially like effective field theory that reproduces hydrodynamic equations of motion, but also lets you compute compute loops in hydrodynamics. So kind of loop effects. And uh, it's, a, it's a very nice theory. And we're gonna sort of use this theory as a starting point to formulate our effective theory, as you'll see later. Okay, so let me start out with an example. So we're, we have something very tangible. And I want to talk about structure that arises from locality. So let's suppose you have a physical system that lives in, you know, d-dimensional space, little d. This is space, not space-time. So you have a quantum field theory or a mini-body system of some sort in d dimensions of space. And let's imagine we've broken all the symmetries, we've, we've added some external potential, et cetera. So all the symmetries are broken except energy conservation, time translation symmetry. And we're at finite energy density above the ground state. You would, in that case, expect that if you make some lump of energy, that lump of energy is going to slowly diffuse throughout the system. And that will be the slowest mode which controls how fast system approaches thermal equilibrium. That can be described by this diffusion equation. So the first two terms here are just the standard diffusion equation. And it'll also be useful for us to, important to consider this, this noise term. So this represents fluctuations, quantum or thermal fluctuations in the energy density. Of course, this has to vanish at zero momentum because the total energy is conserved, but finite wave vector energy density modes, they can fluctuate. And this noise is generically present, and so we'll, we'll keep this full equation. And the idea is that from this equation, what you can see is if you go to some basis of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, let's just think about plane waves for simplicity, that at a given moment in time, t, there'll be a characteristic wave vector, which I denote k sub t, such that all wave vectors smaller than that k sub t have correspond to modes that have barely decayed. Right, the decay rate is set by the diffusivity d times k squared. And so if k is less than this kt, that means that these modes have decayed by less than one e fold. They're essentially still close to their initial condition. And what that means is that at a given moment in time, there is a very large number of almost conserved modes. All the modes with wave vector less than this kt they have barely decayed, and therefore they correspond to some almost conserved degree of freedom in the system. This arises just from locality and energy conservation. So it's an extremely generic feature. Any spatially extended system can't really be random matrix like at early time because you have all these nearly conserved modes. And that means the Hamiltonian is like a block diagonal structure approximately with one block for each almost conserved 
sector. And the way I like to think about this is just think about a generic energy fluctuation, E of X and T. And we're going to decompose this in the basis of the Laplacian. Here again, I've just drawn plane waves. So we have some amplitude for wave vector K1 times the corresponding mode profile for K1, some K2, K2, and et cetera. And for each choice of these amplitudes, we have a different pattern of energy fluctuations. And those are all almost conserved because they've all only weakly decayed after a given time. So what would you expect? The form factor is like a second moment, it's like a variance. And so you would expect the form factor would be equal to maybe the random matrix behavior within each sector times the number of sectors because variances add. So if each sector is independent, you add up the variances and the form factor will be the number of sectors. In this case, the number of sectors would be like e to the number of modes. And so you would expect some behavior which is like linear in time times the exponential of this number of modes. Okay. Brian, may I ask yeah. one question? Is e here a number or an operator? Um, is, oh, the energy, energy. Uh, the D, the, 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 not the Laplacian, but the D, is that a number or an operator? Oh, this is, this is just the diffusion constant. Okay, a constant. Yeah, so it, it depends on the background energy density, but it's just a number. Okay, it could be an operator, and then this thing is harder to understand. Yeah, yeah, you, you could generalize this in, in some way. Uh, uh, could uh, I ask a question about the, the, the potential you have here? Uh, so, uh, and then you're looking at really a, a kind of heat equation, right? Uh, correct, yes. Yeah, so rather than Schrodinger. Uh, and, and but what what conditions do you have on your on your on your C? Uh, this is a this so this 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 noise term so it's a stochastic term in this formulation, and it's it's is it time dependent? It's time dependent, but it's chosen so that energy is conserved. So in particular, it has some correlation function, um, and that correlation function has the property that if you look at the zero the zero wave vector component, the total energy, that's conserved, but the finite wave vector components can fluctuate. The, the non-zero wave vector components can fluctuate. May I ask one more? Isn't um, the stochastic differential equation description here um, correct? Is that what you're looking for? An SDE stochastic can you say differential again? equations? I mean, usually if you do heat kernel analysis in classical analysis, you do stochastic differential equations to solve it. Yes. To, to, to somehow explain the, the correction of the noise so that you get a nice semi-group of um, heat semi-group operators, right? Is yes. that what you have in mind or more exotic noise? Because no, the no, noise no. Is this is just totally standard. This is just the noise you have to have okay, good. to satisfy you know, your various conditions. So I just have a totally you know, standard, isolated quantum many body system, quantum field theory, this should be the effective description of the long wavelength energy fluctuations in that okay. theory. And so in particular, if I just compute the average, you know, if I really view this epsilon as an operator and I compute the average of it, then the noise will not be important. But if I look at statistical correlations, then the noise can play an effect. Okay, so uh, Mike and I made a model of this to try to understand very quantitatively what's going on. And the model is very simple. We have a Hamiltonian H naught with a bunch of blocks. That's these gray things where the off diagonal matrix elements are strictly zero. So H naught defines our approximately decoupled sectors. And then on the off diagonals, we have some smaller matrix elements controlled by V, which calls transitions between these sectors. And the idea would be that within each gray block and within each blue block, you have a random matrix. So the gray blocks kind of thermalize amongst themselves or equilibrate, but the dynamics between different gray blocks is slow. It's controlled by these blue blocks. And one can make a very naive calculation just using Fermi's golden rule. And you find that when you neglect these blue blocks, you just get the form factor for a random matrix times the number of sectors at a given energy. So just what you would expect. But then once you include the transitions, you get this very nice formula here in which I sum over sectors alpha. So alpha labels different blocks. 
and I get the form factor within each block and a return probability. So this is the probability to start in sector alpha and after time t return to sector alpha. And viewing the form factor as these return amplitudes, this is a quite natural result. The only thing that's happening here is that there's a sort of a dephasing so that the amplitudes become probabilities. But this this result is fairly general and relies on minimal assumptions, essentially just that these probabilities don't depend on the microstate within each block that you start in. And then within that assumption, you can derive this formula. Okay, so let's just do a calculation. I don't want you to try to follow the details of this. It's not very complicated if you just sit down and do it, but let's just say at the top, we have the probability as a function of wave vector k and time t to have a certain final amplitude for the energy of wave vector k in terms of the initial amplitude dk and the decay rate. So here gamma k is just dk squared. It's the decay rate from my diffusion equation. This just comes from solving this equation. There is some specific variance here, but we don't even actually need the form of this because it's actually possible to do the integral over the initial condition. So we just say, what's the probability that the initial energy is equal to the final energy at time t integrated over all initial energies? And that gives you this very nice, essentially some version of the, the Bose factor, okay? And just in the usual way, you go from counting wave vectors to counting modes, sort of just like a sort of statistical boson problem the sum over sectors translates into a product over modes of this decay factor for each mode. Then if you go to the continuous wave vector regime, where these k's can be approximated as continuous, you can actually calculate this precise function here, with, uh, which is very similar to what we had on the previous slide, except there's a little bit of a different numerical factor uh, coming from this zeta function. Okay, so conclusion is we do a precise calculation. We get exactly what we expected to get up to some numerical factor that we could not hope to quite exactly reproduce with our crude or previous arguments. We just get e to the number of sectors up to some factor. Okay, and this now lets us answer the question of what's the thallus time? Well, we need to wait long enough so that all of these sectors are in their ground state. They've all decayed. And a simple calculation shows that if you wait a time proportional to the linear size, L squared divided by D, this is like, like the inverse decay rate of the slowest mode. If you wait that long of time, plus some factor that depends on how close you want to be, then you will be within epsilon of uh, the random matrix result. Okay, so incredibly physically sensible, I would say. You just wait till all of your diffusing modes have completely relaxed. And then this theory predicts that you will be close to the random matrix answer. So that makes kind of a lot of sense. The system has essentially forgotten the structure. It's forgotten the spatial locality because you've given it enough time for even the slowest diffusing modes to fully equilibrate. We can compare this actually with numerical experiment. In this work, uh, Friedman et al. reported here in the archive paper, they actually computed this form factor for a quantum mechanical spin chain. What they actually considered was not diffusion of energy, but diffusion of a U1 charge, but the analysis is very similar. And so these different colors denote different system sizes from 12 up to 18. You can see they're plotting here the logarithm of the form factor divided by T. So form factor divided by T is just giving you the enhancement part. It's removing the linear and T growth. And so you take the log, you would expect to get the log of this thing here. You just expect to get the linear size times this diffusive time scale. So then they scale time in units of the natural diffusion time, t over L squared, and they observe approximate data collapse of their different system sizes onto this one curve. And then the black line here is just a fit to that previous formula for d equals 0.05. Okay, so this is all their work. And they also derive that previous formula in a special limit where they take their spin chain and make the on-site Hilbert space dimension very large. So in that special limit, N1D, they could also derive this formula. We derive it more generally just from the perspective of diffusion. 
And of course, they roughly agree with the numerical data. They don't perfectly agree, so there's probably still something to understand here. It is a very small size system, but you can see that there is a strong enhancement. This is the log. So a strong enhancement at an early time, which then rapidly decays on this characteristic diffusive time scale. And then at long time is getting close to the log being zero, which means the form factor is just linear. Okay. And I, I won't talk about it, but we actually, in our effective theory that I'll describe later, we can actually compute corrections to this diffusive, simple sort of Gaussian diffusive theory and show that they're not large, at least in perturbation theory. So it's kind of a, a further justification of this. Okay. So let me just summarize. We saw an example of how structure arises very naturally in physical systems, in this case from locality. That structure can lead, among other things, to slow modes. Those slow modes inhibit the onset of random matrix theory in terms of the form factor. But eventually, once you wait long enough for all of the modes to decay, you recover the random matrix answer. And their predictions actually even agree quantitatively with numerics that one can do in spin chains. Okay, so that's what I have in mind. We want to have a theory of the slow modes. We want to understand what's the time scale for them to approach this random matrix behavior and, uh, and you know, ideally compare to some numerical or experimental result. So now I'm going to talk about an effective theory of this. I gave you an example, but what's the more general underlying structure that we can use to understand how this works? And our suggestion is that you should think of this form factor as actually being related to hydrodynamics in the following sense. So at the top here, we have what's called the schwinger keldish contour, or NN formalism, or closed time path formalism, lots of different names for this, depending on your community. But the basic idea is you have a density matrix, that's the purple blob, you have a forward evolution and a backward evolution, you want a mu2. We can allow to couple different background fields along these two contours. And by taking derivatives of this generating functional with respect to background fields, we can produce all kinds of interesting correlation functions. Okay, so it's like a tool for generating time-dependent correlation functions out of equilibrium in a quantum system. Okay. And our observation is that this schwinger keldish contour is actually quite similar to the form factor contour. They both involve this forward and backward branch. The difference, and it's an important difference, but the difference is that they have different boundary conditions. In the schwinger keldish case, I have a state and this condition that the two contours agree at late time. In the form factor case, I have no initial state and no requirement they agree but I just have this periodic boundary condition. So our suggestion is that we can generate an effective theory of the form factor given an effective theory of the schwinger keldish contour. And that effective theory of the schwinger keldish contour is exactly what the fluctuating hydrodynamic story is all about. Let me quickly just review that. I apologize in that you're, you know, if you don't already know this story, you're not going to learn it here, but let me just give you a flavor. The idea is that you have these two contours, U1 and U2, forward and backward. And a very convenient basis of the field space is to go to symmetric and anti-symmetric fields on these two contours. These are called classical or R-type and quantum or A-type, depending on your community. And what's nice about this basis is that there's a lot of powerful rules that constrain effective actions built from these fields. For example, if you set U1 equal to U2, then this whole thing is independent of time, trivially, just because of the unitarity of time evolution. And so roughly that translates into the statement that if your A-type variables are zero, then the effective action has to vanish. Okay, so every term in the effective action has to have at least one power of an A-type variable in it. And there are other important rules that uh, relate to KMS condition, to unitarity, and to all kinds of related statements. So here's an example of it, just a simplest example that describes diffusion like we were talking about before. We have a, an A-type, an R-type variable epsilon, which is like the, you kind of just think of the energy density. We have an A-type variable phi A, which is sort of like going to play the role of Lagrange multiplier. And so if you ignore this second term here, this phi A squared term, then this 
action is very simple. The equation of motion of phi A is just the diffusion equation for epsilon. And so indeed phi A is like a Lagrange multiplier. If you take the extra step of uncompleting the square, so you uncomplete the square here by introducing some hubbard stratonovich field, then you get, again, that phi is like a multiplier, but now you have a noise term in the diffusion equation. So this actually just exactly reproduces that noisy dynamics that we had in the previous slide. And in particular, you can see that the form of the noise is fixed and has the property that it vanishes at zero wave vector. So this is a way of formalizing that diffusion equation we had before. And, and of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can do a lot more, but this is just a, an effective theory of, of that. So our suggestion is that we can take this effective theory, we can modify the boundary conditions in an appropriate way and get an effective theory of the form factor count. So here's a precise assumption. At some cutoff scale of our field theory, we have the same hydrodynamic action, but with modified boundary condition. Why is that reasonable? Well, we got that effective theory by integrating out some fast modes, some modes that decay rapidly. And of course, we've changed the boundary condition from this stringer kellish case to the periodic case. But as long as those modes will have decayed a great amount by the time you get to the end of this contour, you wouldn't expect the integrating out to change the answer very much. In other words, they're going to be insensitive to the boundary condition because they just decayed. So the fast modes you've integrated out actually don't care too much the fact that the boundary condition has changed. Or more precisely, you will have terms that violate the rules of the schringer keldish theory, but those terms are exponentially suppressed in the length of time. Okay, So we can ignore them after a short period of time. We need to also assume that this modified theory gives the relevant saddle point for the path integral. And there also also be some averaging, some disorder that connects these two contours because otherwise they're not coupled at all, whereas this theory does have them coupled in an important way. And that averaging we already saw was important just to have a regular function of time to actually predict. Okay, so there's, there's, there's a lot of physics that goes into this, but maybe the best way to see that it's reasonable is to just calculate. Uh, let me just skip this and just go to the calculation. So why is this interesting? What does it make sense? Let's first think about just the spatial zero mode, OK? Um, so let's go to the situation where all of the finite k, non-zero k modes have decayed. Our system is fully equilibrated. We can just consider this very simple effective action now. We're ignoring all of the non-zero wave vector modes. We just essentially have the zero mode of energy, total energy, and this zero mode like on multiplier. Okay. And in the schringer keldish case, these, these, these integration variables in the path integral are constrained. The total energy is constrained by the initial state here. Right. If this is a thermal state, then that produces a tightly peaked distribution of energy. And phi A, which is essentially like the relative time shift between the two contours, is actually also constrained to vanish at this future point because the contours have to agree. So think about phi A as like the time shift, epsilon is like the total energy. So indeed, this is like has the right units to be in action. And uh, in the Schringer Keldish case, the time shift is fixed to be zero at the future, and the energy is constrained by the initial state. Now, in the form factor case, that's not true anymore. The energy is actually not constrained, so we should integrate over it. And similarly, the time shift between these two contours is also not constrained, so we should integrate over it. However, these are circles, and so the appropriate domain of integration is not the real line, but a circle. And you can actually even be careful about the path integral measure if you carefully regulate this thing and put your two pi's in the right places. And you can argue that this form factor, just from the zero modes, contributes the zero mode in the time shift, which is just the time t, the zero mode in the energy, that's the integral, integral over the total energy, and even a factor of one over two pi that gives you the right behavior. And so you actually precisely get out the random matrix answer from the zero modes. 
So we went into this business expecting to calculate corrections, but having to assume the random matrix behavior. But actually, this formalism of, appears to be powerful enough to, you know, I won't say it proves that it's a random matrix, of course, it's, it's just a framework, but it gives you the random matrix answer out very naturally from the zero modes. Okay. But the whole path integral is a Gaussian. So we can actually also compute all of the finite non-zero wave vector modes. Here's our action. Here's our measure. You sit down for a few hours. It's a Gaussian path integral. You do the calculation. And just believe me that when you do the calculation, you get this formula for the form factor, which precisely reproduces our previous result from the linear diffusion equation. Okay. So this path integral perspective both predicts the ramp at late time and exactly calculates the corrections to it and is based on this principled sort of transporting of the effective action from Schwinger and Keldish to the form factor content. Okay. So this is now our desired effective theory. We gave here the example of diffusion, but if we put in some other kind of system, say uh, a sound mode or a Goldstone boson or some more complicated space-time diffeomorphisms, we could in principle do the same calculations and get the prediction for corrections to random matrix theory in that system. And very satisfyingly, it's all about the physics of slow modes in that system. That's exactly what hydrodynamics is capturing. It's capturing the physics of your slow modes. Okay, so that's the core idea, the core proposal. We've now elaborated on it in a lot of different situations. And I just want to flash a couple of those just to give you a flavor of what we're thinking about at the moment. Uh, the first is about sound. So this is work again with Mike uh, that appeared just late last year. And the idea, like I said, is we have this formalism so we can just apply it to some kind of more complicated situation, for example, where the relevant dynamics is not diffusive, but, but ballistic, like a sound wave. This might occur in uh, a system with a Goldstone boson, for example, or, or just be a part of an actual theory with sound, ordinary sound. Uh, at the top, again, don't worry about the details, but this is this is a sort of typical, prototypical action in this stringer keldish formalism that can give you sound. Um, if you diagonalize this action, you look for the, for the frequencies. There are three of them, two sound poles. Here is your linear dispersion with C, the speed of sound, and then some decay, plus another mode which is purely decaying and doesn't, his decay rate does not vanish as you take K to zero. So that's just a rapidly decaying mode. We ignore that mode. And then the prediction of our theory is just immediately follows that there's an enhancement to the form factor which takes the form of a product over eigenvalues of Laplacian times some characteristic factor that we can calculate. It's just a generalization of that, that the diffusive factor from before with the crucial point that now there are imaginary terms because the sound has a propagating component as well as, well as a decaying. Okay, so this is the sort of master formula for sound. And then we apply this to a bunch of cases. In one dimension, you get sort of an intricate fractal pattern arising from like a complicated way in which the modes go in and out of resonance with the cavity size, the time cavity size. In higher dimensions, you get a very interesting set of new behaviors where you have to ask for these K modes, are they themselves, which are the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, are, are they themselves integrable or chaotic in the sense of kind of the single particle physics of the Laplacian? So if this Laplacian corresponded to some billiard or some domain, would that billiard be chaotic or would that billiard be integrable? And depending on what you have, if the billiard is integrable, then you expect these Ks to be Poisson distributed. That gives one characteristic form for the enhancement. On the other hand, if the cavity is uh, going to be chaotic, then that gives you a very different character to the Laplacian. The Laplacian now has itself a random matrix-like spectrum. And so you get kind of a single particle 
random matrix form factor arising as the enhancement of your mini body random matrix form factor. Okay, so it's this very intricate result where sort of the single particle character of the sound modes comes in and can give you this qualitatively different behavior for the mini body form factor arising from hydro. And just as an example, uh, here's the result in 1D. This, this, there's a special function here that has many names. One of the names that we like a lot is stars over Babylon. Um, and the idea, as you see here, this kind of intricate pattern of peaks and troughs as a function of time. This is basically like having to do with under what conditions do your sound modes come into resonance as a function of time for a given system size. And there is a, you can, of course, compute this predictor pattern, but there's also an envelope function you can also compute, which is closely related to what we calculated in the diffusive case. This envelope comes from the decay part here. And okay, you can reproduce this uh, precise formula. This is not, to my knowledge, testable yet in any numerics or experiment, but we have a completely precise prediction for what you would expect in 1D. Okay, so that's sound. That's a very interesting story. Um, another interesting story is to talk about glasses, because these are also systems where you expect a sort of slow mode, some kind of slowly decaying, nearly conserved sectors associated with the inability of the system to fully thermalize. And in this case, there was actually two recent papers that we put out, um, one led by Mike, in which we looked at this form factor in a certain specific uh, toy model called the spherical the quantum p-spherical model. It's a sort of toy model of a quantum spin glass. And then another paper read by another student, Richard Barney at Maryland, in which we introduced an even simpler, um, an even simpler toy model, very similar to our block model from earlier. And uh, in this case, we were actually able to compute the entire form factor, including the plateau. So one general feature, which I did not emphasize very much, is that a lot of this stuff that I've talked about so far only works for the ramp region. It doesn't actually know about the plateau. It doesn't predict the existence of the plateau. And in this first work, we did not, we were, you know, we did not exhibit the plateau. It's just a ramp calculation. But in this later work, we have enough control to actually give the plateau behavior itself. And let me just show you how that works. Um, I'll focus on the second paper. The idea is you have uh, there's a famous model called the Rosenzweig Porter model. And we made a generalization of that called the block RP model. And the idea is you have uh, H, which is a sum of two pieces, and A, which for RP is just diagonal, and for block RP is block diagonal, and then another V, which is just a totally random matrix. And so it's, it's sort of similar in spirit to our block model, where you have kind of the blocks determined by A, and then these interactions determined by V. And depending on how you scale the size of V and the variance of A with system size N, here now N is the number of dimensions in the Hilbert space, depending on how you scale things, you can get different behaviors. So you can, for example, get a regime where there are blocks in A that behave like independent blocks at early time, but then due to the effects of V, eventually recombine into one big block at late time. So very analogous to the physics we were discussing before. You can tune to other regimes, but that's probably the most interesting. And you can get plots like this for the form factor on the y-axis as a function of time. These different curves correspond to different degrees of coupling between the different blocks. The gray line here is the, the GUE answer. That's the kind of the baseline answer. And these other curves, they start out with P equals 20 independent blocks. And then these blocks, is, these blocks mix together to produce one big block. And so you see, depending on how strong the coupling is, they start out with this enhanced form factor, the form factor times 20, and then they cross over to give you just the random matrix form factor. And the crossover happens at later and later time as you weaken the coupling. Okay, So it's just a precise theory that we can compute all of this curve analytically using this complicated theory. And we can also perfectly match it to numeric, which is which is uh, what these these um, solid lines are. So it's like just 
in some ways recapitulating what we had before, but also now showing us what's going on at late time around the plateau. And actually, we didn't expect this, but we found something new there. We found something we did not expect. And so for this final part, I want to tell you about that new thing. And this is work in progress now with, with Mike. And it's really about new structure that we did not expect at, at late time in these systems. Okay, so let's look again at uh, a graph as a function of time of the form factor on the y-axis. There is now four blocks. These blocks are 500 by 500 blocks. So it's a 2000 by 2000 matrix altogether. And we've chosen the coupling between these blocks to be weak enough so that you see some kind of early time enhancement down here, just as we predicted from our theory before. And you can see that there's some early time enhancement. That enhancement dies away. And then there's a very long period of essentially perfectly linear behavior. Right. And then the random matrix result would be that you have this very sharp transition to the plateau. This is a GUE matrix. And so you get a very sharp transition in that case. However, what we find instead is that there's a softening and there's a suppression around this plateau time. Okay. And I want to emphasize we really weren't expecting this, but we actually noticed it because we had these exact all time results in the BRP model from Barney, okay? So the question is, what is this suppression? This is really, you know, a really weird effect. Just to give you some sense of time, suppose you had like a cubic nanometer of uh, graphite, say, you can use the uh, measured thermal conductivity of graphite to estimate the thallus time, just back out the diffusion constant and use that to figure out the thallus time. That time would be of order 10 to the minus 11 seconds. Okay, so very small. Then you can figure out the entropy of the system just using the heat capacity and estimate the entropy of your little chunk of graphite. The Dallas, the, the Heisenberg time where the plateau happens should be sort of e to the entropy. That's the level spacing, inverse level spacing. That's about 10 to the 13 years. So you have 10 to the minus 11 seconds where you have this little enhancement, then 10 to the 13 years of perfectly linear growth. And then as we'll see, it turns out you'll have another 10 to the minus 11 seconds right around the plateau where you have this little suppression. So it's a tiny effect, but it's a very interesting effect and a very sensitive test of your theory of this system. So what's going on? Well, First of all, we convinced ourselves that this is a real effect by observing that there is actually a sum rule obeyed by the form factor. If L is the plateau value and you integrate the form factor minus the plateau value over all time, and as long as there's even a little bit of level repulsion, you just need enough, you can show that this integral approaches zero as you extend the time domain to infinity, at least sort of one over polynomial in the upper limit of the integral. So this form factor sum rule means that if you have an enhancement in the form factor at early time, it has to be paid back at late time with some sort of suppression. And that's indeed what we saw here. And just from I, you can sort of see that the time scale and height of these two, you know, height, by height, I mean the deviation from the ideal result, both the, the sort of time of the bump and the height of the bump are roughly comparable. And so just by I, it looks reasonable that these would integrate to roughly zero, something relatively small. Indeed, you can check that's the case. And so we know that this is actually a fairly general feature that anytime you have this enhancement, you have to sort of pay for it with suppression later. It's not necessarily a priori clear where that suppression has to occur, but at least numerically, we see that it has to occur around the plateau time, the Heisenberg time. And so we thought about this for quite a while. We're still working on this, but we actually have a conjecture now for a totally concrete formula for GUE type problems, meaning problems without universal symmetry, um, for this suppression at late time. And it's based on something called the Riemann Siegel lookalike, uh, it's old work of Barry and Keating. I'll describe that in a moment, but let me just tell you the formula first. So the idea is the form factor is a sum of a short time and a long time piece. 
the short time piece is our linear and t behavior. Okay, so that's the ramp. But the ramp is corrected by these decaying modes that come from our sectors that are slowly mixing into each other. Now, you take those same decay rates at long time, you find that the long time form factor is now a convolution of the ideal answer with these different decay rates, this characteristic exponential decay function. The, the sort of bare answer for a long time is just zero or the plateau value minus t. And so if you had none of these lambdas, if all the lambdas were infinite, you would see you just get linear t and then a plateau. But because you have these slow modes at early time, that translates into this smearing of the transition with a very characteristic form. And if you then plug in that form into, you know, you can calculate the decay rate for that four block system. There's a couple of, there's three decay rates because there's there's a one zero mode that doesn't change. That's the uniform state where you fully mixed and then three decaying modes. You can calculate all of those modes using Fermi's golden rule. You can plug it into our convolution formula. You first of all perfectly reproduce the early time bump, the enhancement, and then at late time, you also perfectly reproduce the suppression to the plateau. Okay. So this theory works seemingly. And it's totally precise. There's no factors or anything else here. It's just a completely explicit formula. And just to wrap up, let me tell you where this came from, uh, just verbally, because we're still working on the details. But the, the basic idea is that, you know, it starts from this Riemann sequel formula for the zeta function. So if you take the zeta function, you look at its series form, you look on the critical line where the argument is a half plus imaginary part. The zeta function is not absolutely convergent there. So it actually is sort of hard, you know, it takes a lot of effort to sum up the series well enough to get a good approximation. What Riemann and later Siegel realized, based on Riemann's notebook is my understanding, that there is actually a way to circumvent this, to, to truncate the series, sort of resum it, and get a finite expression, which gives you the values of the zeta function to a very high degree of approximation. Okay, so along comes Barry. Barry says, well, actually it's sort of known that the zeros of the zeta function are similar to the energy levels of a quantum chaotic system. They are random matrix-like in a certain sense. That's a remarkable observation. And Barry used that to understand a lot of the sort of mathematical properties of zeta from a sort of physics point of view. And more interestingly to our purposes here, he also, along with Keating and others, observed that you can generalize this kind of approach to other sorts of quantum chaotic systems, not just the zeta function, but more general kinds of systems. And this led to something called the Riemann-Siegel lookalike formula, which was essentially a formula for the, the basically energy levels or form factor of the system, the, the correlations which would effectively resum a bunch of terms and give you the behavior at, at late time. So people have understood from like periodic orbit theory how to get the ramp in these old style quantum chaotic systems, but they did not necessarily know how to get the plateau. And Barry and Keating showed that with this lookalike formula, you could get the plateau as well. And the basic insight from a physics point of view is that there's some sort of relationship between long periodic orbits and short periodic orbits. Okay, and once you have that understanding, then that suggests that there should indeed be a relationship between the sort of slow modes at early time and these suppression modes at late time. And you take this Riemann-Siegel lookalike, you use something called spectral determinant, you turn the crank, you work a little bit, and you arrive at this formula relating the early time enhancement to the late time suppression. And so I just want to emphasize this formula is technically sort of only deriven, de derived for systems where this lookalike is available, which is something that's been argued for for systems with like semi-classical semi -classical orbit picture of quantum chaos. But at least from our random matrix results from this like numerics here, it seems to work more generally. And we think indeed it's a more general formula. 
And so although we cannot derive it in full generality yet, we conjecture that this is actually a totally general expression which relates early time to late time. Okay. So let me just summarize then, since I'm about out of time. Um, we sort of started out in this journey some years ago, trying to understand how to calculate corrections from sort of physical structure, from locality, from slow modes, et cetera, in real systems. To calculate corrections arising from that structure to random matrix behavior. But what we came away with in the end was something much more than that. It was actually a framework for this calculation, which also had the feature that it predicted the random matrix behavior itself, or at least made it very natural. And that's exactly what I was looking for at the start. I was looking for a framework that sort of made it quote unquote obvious that random matrix behavior was the default answer. And to have something else, you needed to have more structure in your system. And then when we do have that extra structure, we see that that causes corrections, but those corrections eventually die away as long as these modes have some finite decay. There's lots of other cases that we looked at I didn't mention, like symmetry breaking, Goldstone bosons, et cetera. But the big picture is that we have this new effective theory that kind of rationalizes random matrix behavior, lets us compute corrections. And now, surprisingly, even we have a theory of how those corrections at early time are reflected at late time. So we're getting close now to a sort of complete picture of the form factor in physical systems, at least a conjectured complete picture. And uh, this is very interesting for lots of different reasons. It's interesting, for example, in the context of quantum gravity, where this form factor has been a very sensitive probe of the structure of black holes, their microstates, their entropy, et cetera. It's very interesting in many body physics where this thermalization is an important question we want to understand. And more generally, it's just important to understand, in my view, how this very general behavior kind of comes about, how to think about it. And that's what we're trying to make progress on here. So thanks a lot for your attention and very happy to take uh, any questions. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That was a beautiful overview and it had a number of intriguing open problems. So I'm sure there'll be a great deal of discussion. I'd like to have people turn on their video when they make comments. It would be nice to open the floor now and hear some feedback. Yanis, I'm sure, made a comment. So maybe you'd like to be the first one. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for, for, for a great talk. Uh, can you summarize again what makes the formula you just described not general, like currently in your current stage of the proof? What, what, like you say you conjecture that this is going to be a more general result. Currently, what in the proof, what, what are the limitations or the assumptions that don't yet make it general? If you can repeat it again or summarize. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so, yeah. So what I would say is, we believe the formula is general and we've tested it, you know, for, for systems that do not have any sort of semi-classical description, just these random matrix blocks. But the actual derivation of the formula, the only derivation we have at present, proceeds via semi-classical analysis. So specifically what you have is periodic orbits. You use a gutz wheeler trace formula to produce a formula for the energy density. Then you use the Riemann Siegel lookalike on that to produce a more convergent answer. This lets you calculate spectral determinants in some way. And then from that, you get a form factor expression. And that just follow those steps mathematically, you arrive at the formula I wrote. Um, but that's the sense in which it's restricted, the derivation is restricted to these semi classical systems. But the formula itself, as far as we can tell, is general. And, and I, I would conjecture that it's general. Thank you. Hi, can I have a question? Please. Yeah, I I, I just uh, I'm just confused by uh, what's the physical like meaning of the uh, like the, the mode epsilon. I think it has to be correspond it has to be correspond corresponded to some some kind of 
things in the random matrix theory, but I did not fully understood that. And also this phi A, what's the physical meaning of that? Uh, uh, yeah, so the, so the epsilon originally was the energy density of my system, right? So it's just as a function of space and time, I have a certain profile of energy, right? And that's the natural dynamical variable for studying the diffusion of energy. You just solve for the dynamics of that profile. Then in the context of the schringer keldish effective theory, it was an integration variable, which was sort of, you know, it's uh, on, on saddle points, it would describe the energy density, but more generally, it's a variable I integrate over in the path integral. And phi A was similarly a variable that I would integrate over. It would typically play the role of a Lagrange multiplier, which just enforces the equation of motion of the energy density. But you can also, it has a very interesting physical interpretation as being related to the relative time between the two contours. So there, there's a way of viewing this whole theory as like a theory of the map between fluid time and physical time. And this phi A is related to that map or sort of the anti-symmetric part of it. And so you can understand this kind of a map between fluid time and physical time, and in particular, a map between it's like controlling the relative time between these two contours. And so the, the sort of picture is like you can kind of have these two con these two circles and you can pair them up however you like, but there's an overall time shift that is undetermined and you need to integrate over that. So you have a family of saddle points indexed by that relative time shift. And that's where that's the zero mode in the path integral. Oh, I see. Thank you. So Tom, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I have a question about uh, what your effective field theory was in the end. Uh, so I understand you have some kind of Lagrange multiplier that enforces, uh, but your was your effective field theory actually quadratic or uh, I didn't quite understand whether you had it uh, in your terms there. Yes, I mean, it's not, it's not essential that it be quadratic, but the examples I showed were all quadratic. Um, yeah, so that's correct. And so one can include interaction terms. So for example, one way an interaction term arises very, very naturally is that the energy density, the, the fusion constant depends on the background energy density, right? If you lower or raise the yeah. temperature, the diffusion is different. We're familiar with that effect. And so that means energy, the diffusion constant is actually a function of energy. And so then if I expand that out around you know, the background value, I'm going to get vertices, nonlinear non non quadratic uh, terms in the action so in ordinary hydrodynamics these terms are interesting and important they give rise to things like long time tails and non analyticities in hydro so there's interesting story there in our case we do not fully understand the physics of these terms like we have this time periodic theory so it's an unusual kind of quantum field theory so i would say there's a kind of a whole host of interesting questions about how to make sense of this. Is there an RG, et cetera? But as the first thing to do, you can just compute loops perturbatively. And we did that. And you find that they are suppressed. Like for a large system, if you scale time according to the diffusive scaling, the loops give a suppressed effect. OK, so consistently, at least in perturbation theory, <laughs> the Gaussian theory is a good approximation. But more generally, I would say it's kind of an open question what effects these things can have. Thank you. Yeah, I also have a question. Uh, how can I understand that uh, in random magic theory, you assume that uh, the interaction is weak so we can use perturbation? I, I think maybe uh, in, in many cases, the random matrix theory should have a like, strong interaction. This is something that's made me very confused. Yeah, okay. If if I understand your question correctly, I would want to distinguish different notions of weak interaction. So in the random matrix itself, there's no, I'm not making any weak interaction approximation. Like it is this very strongly interacting 
structureless block that's described by my random matrix. And so there's no weak interaction assumption there. Yes. What, what's weak is the hydrodynamic interactions. This, this is because hydrodynamics is usually thought of as, well, the, 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 the interactions are derivative suppressed. It's a you know a derivative. It's a derivative expansion. That's what hydro is, right? So usually we think of the derivative expansion as giving you suppression, so that at very long wavelengths and very long times, the interactions are derivative suppressed and therefore not so important. Now that's not quite true. I mean, there are subtleties there, but that's the basic idea in which hydro is usually thought of as a weakly coupled theory. But that has nothing to do with the underlying strong coupling. You know, even for even for you know n equals four super Yang mills and infinite coupling, you still have hydro with these derivative suppressed interactions. So hydro structure doesn't have anything directly to do with underlying strong interaction, kind of at the short time scale. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank you again, Brian. It was really a beautiful talk. And I look forward to the new results. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. See people again next week. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.